And I'm going to try to treat this as a continuation of my last talk. Uh, and again, my wife and I are still in the process of moving, so once again I didn't actually have the text to prepare, which now that I've seen the text, I'm really glad I didn't. I went by the actual catechism, and so I think you're going to get a better talk than you would have if I had been saddled with talking about uh, the idea of social justice and, uh, and that. So, um, what I'm going to do instead is to talk about something that I think is more pertinent to us as individuals, and um, maybe we'll talk a little bit about social justice, but what I'm going to do is talk about this continual idea of uh, life in Christ. And so you'll, hopefully if you were here, although there seem to be four times more people here this week than there were last week, so 75% uh, of you are going to be lost. Uh, yeah, the more people show up for you, yeah. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint. Okay, so the last time uh, we talked a little bit, or, or a lot, I guess, about uh, the idea of uh, lining ourselves up for a certain trajectory, and that trajectory was we want to align ourselves with Christ to the extent uh, that we will hopefully get to heaven. And so we talked about some technical things, kind of the blueprint behind our everyday actions, and that is uh, the idea of conscience and the passions and our freedom and sin and our own responsibility and our responsibility for the sin of others and things like that. And so, in order to better understand this idea of our slavery to sin and our ultimate freedom being uh, aligning ourselves with Christ and therefore taking on the yoke of Christ, becoming slaves to Christ and shedding our slavery to sin, um, we are going to talk generally about the Decalogue. We're going to talk about the Ten Commandments generally. Uh, this is probably a good class because the, uh, at least in the abstract, not necessarily my content, but generally speaking, it's a good thing to talk about because um, the next few classes are going to be specific things, uh, specific commandments. We're going to talk about specific commandments. I have the dubious task in a few weeks of giving on... Um, Thou shalt not steal. I'm not sure how you spend an hour and a half talking about that, except maybe saying, Thou shalt not steal 90 times or something. Uh, so, I guess I'll figure that out in a few weeks when we get there. So today I'm going to talk generally about the Decalogue. And um, I want to begin by talking about the history of the Decalogue. Now, I know that there are people in the audience who have read the Old Testament several dozen more times than I have, I'm sure, and could give a much more accurate recounting of the way in which God delivered the Ten Commandments to Moses. But I want to focus on kind of an overview of Old Testament history because it's illustrative of our life and our uh, movement away from sin. The Roman Catechism is going to be the catechism that I refer to a lot, so let me tell you what the Roman Catechism is. After the Council of Trent in the 16th century, uh, Pope Pius V, Pope St. Pius V, saw fit to order that a catechism be written, basically a document that set forth all the doctrines of the Church. And the Roman Catechism was a document that came out of that. It was actually written by another saint, or at least in part by St. Robert Bellarmine, who's a doctor of the Church. And so the Roman Catechism is probably the most important document or the most important catechism in church history for certain. Um, and so what I reference tonight is going to be large portions of the Roman Catechism. It's not to say that the catechism that we have now is, is not good in some way, uh, but the Roman Catechism is much shorter, much easier to understand, and has much better information on the Ten Commandments than this new catechism does. Uh, one of the things that the Roman Catechism points out keep in mind this is a catechism that's 400 years old, is it sets out the idea that catechumens, basically people in you all situation, 
uh, should begin their Christian instruction. And keep in mind, this is a time where we're talking about, you know, basically people new to, to the whole idea of Christianity, which I know most of you aren't. But catechumens should be instructed in the Ten Commandments. That should be the basis of, how, of where everything begins. Uh, and as an aside, I want to point out that where we are now in the class is that we have spent several months now talking about dogmatic and sacramental theology. So we've talked about all these dogmas of the church, we've gone through the seven sacraments, we talked about the sacramental system, the priesthood, marriage, and all these things. And so we're shifting a little bit now to talk about moral theology. And um, you could look at this like the, the epistle of St. James says that faith without works is dead. And you could kind of reverse that and say that necessarily works without faith are dead. So we've talked about the faith aspect of things, and so now we're going to talk about the works aspect of things, moral theology. Moral theology is, as you will probably notice in your life experience, and as we talk about the Ten Commandments, obviously the same basis forms the uh, moral systematic theology of uh, every Christian group, whether it's Catholic or any other. And so I think that this is probably the area where there's a lot more overlap uh, with every other denomination of Christianity and the Catholic Church. This is especially true when you compare, obviously, the Church's very systematic sacramental theology and dogmatic theology, now talking about moral theology, a lot more similarities. I'm giving Buck a splitting headache. I can see it on his face. Okay. So the Decalogue. The Decalogue forms the foundation of the church's moral theology. So let's talk about the history of the Decalogue. God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses, but there was a lot of history of the Jewish people, or the Israelite people, I should say, leading up to that point. It didn't happen in a vacuum. The Roman Catechism tells us that the very account of the giving of the law shows forth the solemnity with which God gave the law and is a reason for its being followed. So the Roman Catechism sets forth various reasons why we should follow the Ten Commandments. Some of them are very simple to understand. I'm going to talk about them anyway. And the first, or one of them, is the, that we should look at the solemnity with which God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, and that's a reason that we should follow the Ten Commandments. So in the history of the Israelite people, we see that originally God chose this group of people uh, to be his own. But much like the way that God chooses us, he didn't choose them because of their inherent goodness. There was really nothing particularly good or different about them. They were just happened to be a group of people. And we can see that God doesn't choose us because we're already good. He chooses us because we're weak, and he wants to show forth his power and glory by infusing grace within us and making us strong. The weaker we are, and if we're in a weak state, when we do something really incredible, people will say, well, that is really incredible. I can't believe someone so weak did something so incredible. And so that's what God did with the Israelites. He chose the weak to display his power and goodness, and he wanted other nations to see their happiness and embrace the worship of the one true God. This is still true for us today. God had the patriarchs wander the world and be oppressed and suffer servitude to teach that none are friends of God except those who are enemies of the world and pilgrims of the earth. So God chooses us because we're weak, and then he sets us off on a path of suffering sometimes, uh, sometimes we're going to experience joy and happiness, but we're going to experience this because we're a pilgrim people moving through the world, and the world is going to interact with us in certain ways that may or may not be pleasing. But this shows us that we need to have a certain level of detachment from the world in order to be more closely related to God. This is related to the idea that I talked about last week, and that is that we need to uh, try to more closely align ourselves with the life of Christ. So in the history of the Israelite people, God delayed the fulfillment of his promises for hundreds of years to foster faith and hope in his people so that they could be sustained by these virtues. He wanted his people to be dependent upon him. Again, this is a parallel with our faith lives, isn't it? Uh, we are in a sort of um, exile from God, in our own exodus, if you will, and we have to be completely dependent on God through our faith and hope. These are, those are two of the theological virtues that I talked about last week. After a long period of enslavement in Egypt, God finally delivered the Israelites from slavery 
and impressed by their recent experience, they were better disposed to receive the law. So we can see in this that the more detached we are from the world, the more readily we accept the heavenly doctrines. Again, this is a parallel in our life. We need to be detached from the world and we need to be dis dispose ourselves in such a way that we can receive these doctrines from God. And then right before God delivered the Decalogue to Moses, he called for a period of abstinence and chastity uh, for three days so that the people would be better prepared to receive the law. Uh, Father McDonald was mentioning uh, Lent a minute ago when he was in here. I gave a talk a couple of Sundays ago on Septuagesima Sunday about Lent and why we fast during Lent. And uh, we can see that we have a similarity here. We have to train our bodies in such a way that we are more disposed to uh, cooperate with God's law. So the Israelites were ordered to approach the mountain, and yet only one of them ascended it, pursuant to God's command, and that was Moses, obviously. Then we see one of the great theophanies of the Old Testament. Theophany is basically where someone has a face-to-face -face encounter with God. And in this case, it's accompanied by thunder and lightning and clouds and fire and all these crazy things happening, crazy sense experiences. And then God actually speaks to Moses and gives him the commandment through the messengers or angels. Now we haven't yet reached that point in our lives, at least I haven't. If any of you have had a theophany, perhaps you should be teaching these classes. Uh, but uh, we can see that there was a very long period of time where God prepared the people to receive this law. And so a lot of things were moving up to, or, or preparing these people, and they were uh, exiled from God, and they were disposed to receive the law. And so we can recognize that there is a very, the reception of the law to Moses was a very solemn occasion, and he goes down and gives the law to his people. We can see that it's such a solemn occasion that St. Augustine called the commandments the epitome of all laws. So, in the Israelite people we have a type of ourselves. We are in a current state of exodus from our former slavery of sin. And we're in an intermediate period where we're battling against whether we're going to turn back or whether we're going to cooperate with God as he tries to lead us away from uh, sin into true freedom. And that's what I talked about last week. We want to subject ourselves to the light yoke of Christ and become truly free in that way. So any questions or thoughts so far? All right. The interesting thing about the Decalogue is that God makes his will known to us in a very specific way. And even in the delivery of the Decalogue, he points out to the people one of the reasons why they should be following the Decalogue. And that he says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And so you see him basically citing the history of these people as evidence that they need to be following this law. And it's important to note that the commandments have their meaning within the covenant relationship. It's important to remember, as we were talking about a second ago, talking about the lack of inherent goodness of the Israelite people and our own lack of inherent goodness, that God always makes the first move. God always loves his people first. He loved the Israelite people first, and therefore he brought them out of slavery and gave them the, the rules that would make them happy. In the same way, like we were talking about last week, our conversion never starts with our own merit. It never starts with our own idea. The grace of conversion, as I pointed out last week, is always an unmerited grace. No one can merit that grace for us, and we can't merit that grace for ourselves. You'll recall that I pointed out last week there are some graces that we can merit for ourselves, but the grace of conversion is never one of those graces. So God always loves us first. And through the systems that God has established, many of those things we talked about last week, God sets out the path where we can become the children of God, where we can be somehow grafted on to the vine that is Christ. And to remain grafted on that vine, we have to follow certain rules. So the implication of our covenant relationship with God is that God loves us first, He gives us very clear and what we're going to see are easy rules to follow, and it's a pretty simple task for us to simply follow those rules and remain in a right relationship with God. 
Therefore, we remain in the covenant that God has established for us through Christ. The other thing to note about the Decalogue is that it's a very personal sort of law-giving. Um, I don't know how many of you have had occasion to read Georgia's very boring code, like I have, but uh, it's not very personal. The Decalogue is a God using the word I, addressing each one of us individually and also en masse using the word you. Uh, so he's not giving us, you know, generalized statutes to follow. It's more like he's giving us personalized advice that's going to lead us to happiness. Uh, so the tendency, I think, is to view the Decalogue as a bunch of rules and, and we need to follow these rules and otherwise there's going to be punishment. Um, but as with any rule, particularly rules in the church, we have to also look at the positive aspect of them. And I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes. But essentially the idea is that uh, these are the rules that God gives us, not so much so that we'll follow the rules and avoid damnation, but so that we'll follow the rules and get to happiness both in this life and in the next life. Anything yet? I haven't said anything controversial yet. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right. So, since we know that the church is the ultimate teaching authority, we know and, and has the, all the authority to proclaim uh, God's will in terms of both faith and morals, and here we are talking about the moral things, as I discussed earlier, we have to look at the commandments through the lens of the church. And we have to examine the church's teaching so that we can understand the commandments. The Council of Trent, again, that was the 16th century council that issued the Roman Catechism, sets forth the idea that people are still bound to follow the commandments. One thing that we understand from our reading of the New Testament, and something that could possibly be misunderstood, is that we're still bound to follow the commandments. Uh, we all know, or I would hope that we would all recognize, that the laws of the Mosaic Covenant, the covenant given to Moses, are no, no longer applicable to us. We don't have any sort of uh, circumcision rules, and we don't have to, uh, I don't know, can anyone think of, it's like asking for weird, uh, you know, city ordinances, asking for Mosaic laws. What's that? Pork Yeah, we can eat pork. Um... Anything else? That's the only one we know. All right. Well, it's a good thing we don't have to follow those rules. What? what? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we don't have to build our churches to very specific, uh, I don't know, what do they call them, cubits? I don't even know how big a cubit is. I gather it's kind of big. Right. Is that it? See, if you want to make it easy, you got to find a little guy. Okay. All right. <laughs> But we're still bound to follow the Ten Commandments. That's the idea. The Mosaic Law was abrogated. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more later. But we are still bound to follow the Ten Commandments. We're bound because, first of all, well, the author of them is God. And moreover, Christ in the New Testament basically tells us that we have to follow the Ten Commandments. Uh, people ask him, what are the commandments? And he gives a list, basically, of the Decalogue. But as I said, we have to view the Ten Commandments through the lens of the church. And that means that we have to view the commandments through the lens of Christ. And therefore, we have to view them in terms of the two great commandments that Christ gives us. And those are, to love God and to love your neighbor. And the other thing that Christ does with regard to the Ten Commandments is he takes away, I would say, some of the negative aspect that I was talking about earlier in terms of just a rote following. And he throws in the idea of, I'm going to use a nebulous word that I wouldn't normally use, and that is the idea of the heart behind the commandments. Um, I'm talking about here when he says, not only should you not kill somebody, but you shouldn't you know, be angry with them either. Um, not only should you not commit adultery, but you should guard yourself from lustful thoughts. Those were not aspects of the Ten Commandments before Christ told us they were. And so he gives us not only this rote rule that we need to follow, but he gives us all the information we need to understand exactly what it means. Uh, and it means something 
more, right? It means, it means that we need to guard our sense perceptions. This relates in many ways to what we were talking about last week about uh, the virtues, practicing the virtues, and building up the positive aspects through cultivating virtue. But also putting a guard over our passions. Our passions normally are, you know, our sense perceptions that kind of uh, let in information. We need to guard those sorts of things. That's the idea that Christ was getting at when he said, not only don't kill someone, but don't be angry at them. Uh, because if you really think about it, while it's really terrible to kill somebody, um, there's going to be something that led up to that killing, more than likely. When we're talking about murder, anyway. We talked about the difference between murder and homicide last week. But when we talk about murder, there's going to be something that led up to that, and it's going to be anger, generally speaking. So we need to set a guard on that on our interior actions, I would say, and not just our external actions. So we know that Christ gives us a delineation of the commandments. That is, that we are to love God with all our heart, and that, secondly, we are to love our neighbor for the sake of God. So the first three commandments relate to the love of God. And they are the first. I am the Lord your God, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. That's the first. The second is, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And the third, remember to keep holy the Sabbath day. So those very clearly relate to God. We're going to talk more about the content of those in the upcoming weeks. And then the final seven relate to love of neighbor. And these, you can kind of see that these are all like we talked about the Beatitudes last week being kind of leading, one leads into the next. People remember when I talked about that? The commandments do a similar sort of thing, although it's not exactly as clear as the Beatitudes. The fourth commandment, honor your father and your mother. The fifth, you shall not kill. The sixth, you shall not commit adultery. The seventh, you shall not steal. The eighth, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. The ninth, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. And the tenth, you shall not covet your neighbor's goods. So, these are the commandments. It's not. There's some No. Nope. That, that one didn't make it the list. Yep, that one's not on the list. Sorry. You shouldn't do that, though. Where is the false witness commandment? Now, there are different numberings of these commandments, and I believe that they're listed in two books of the Old Testament, Deuteronomy and... What's the second? Do you know? Exodus? Okay, yeah, well, obviously. Yeah. Exodus and Deuteronomy. So I think there are different numberings. These are going to be the, this is the traditional way of listing them, the traditional way of numbering them in, in the Catholic Church. Uh, I recognize that there are differences of numbering. As far as I could tell, the difference was that sometimes you'll see that the ninth and tenth about coveting your neighbor's wife and your neighbor's goods are combined resulting in one less, and then there's the addition of one about not making false idols uh, as added in at number two. Um, so I think the Eastern Orthodox Church numbers them that way, and possibly some other churches number them that way. Uh, so there has been a, a difference in numbering uh, throughout history. I'm honestly not really sure why that difference of numbering happened. I used to know, but I've forgotten. Does anyone know the history about that? All right, good enough. Well, we'll just leave it at that. Okay, I thought you just read, do not bear false witness. Yeah. Did I? Yeah, eight. Okay, all right. I'll there you go, sure. sorry. That doesn't mean, that doesn't fall into lying. False witness would be lying, yes. That would be one part of it, but then like, if I said your shirt looked good and, it really, and I didn't really think it did. Well, I would be mad, yeah. What now? What now? Lies go two ways. Like, you can lie yeah, to somebody to make them feel good. Um, say, if you say to me, how do you like my hair? And I'd say, well, I think it looks great. But inside, I knew it didn't. So is that a lie or is that not a lie? I think that is a lie. Yeah, but yeah. see, the thing is, I said that if I told you, no, I don't like your hair at all, that would have hurt your feelings. <laughs> yeah, but you can't Sometimes remember that you... Sometimes saying lies to keep people from hurt, keep from hurting something. 
Yes, but remember that just because something is, just because you have an, a good intent doesn't mean that something is an evil, okay? Uh, not that this is, I mean, evil is kind of a harsh word, but just because you have a good intent behind it doesn't make it the right thing to do. So you may want to more carefully craft your answer to avoid saying something that's not true. You could simply not answer. Yeah. Right. Yeah. White lies are still sins, so... White lies are still sin, so you can't get around it by saying that, uh, you know, you were trying not to hurt someone's feelings. You know, I don't think that anybody gets new today that they don't say something in a lie. That's probably true. That's very true. Yeah. But just because everyone does it all the time doesn't make it not sinful, does it? No, it doesn't, but it makes the other person feel better sometimes. <laughs> yeah, but they're feeling better based on a lie. So we should say, no, I don't like your hair, and I'm sorry I said that, but I'm not supposed to. <laughs> it doesn't matter what I think of your hair, it's what you think of it because you have to live with it. Maybe something like that, yeah. Or diplomatic yeah. approach. You know? Yeah. Um, so, this is a good illustration, though, of, why you sh of, of how you analyze whether something is a mortal or venial sin, okay? So, in those circumstances, while lying is serious, uh, your intent behind it is not malicious, and so that's what makes this probably a venial sin. Now, that doesn't mean that it's not the sort of thing that you should work on and work on stopping. And given the whatever the circumstances are, you would try to think of a way to get around it. Now, the interesting thing about this is that is lying. But if you heard someone ask you, what do you think of my hair, and you acted like you didn't hear them and turned around and walked away, that's not lying. But it is the same, it is also a sin, and that's called the sin of stimulation. So, um, you can't do that either. So you'll have to reconcile for yourself how, how you sort that out, okay? She's got a great response. This oh. is, go ahead. Oh. <laughs> There you go. That's a good response. That is good. <laughs> that is wisdom, yeah. So, again, we have this, this delineation between, I guess, the two sides of the tablets, if you will. We have the first three that talk about loving God, and the second seven commandments that talk about the love of neighbor. And these were summarized by Christ. He says, "...the love the Lord your God with all your heart, and to love your neighbor as yourself." The important aspect of this is to remember that we love God for His sake. We don't love God because of what He does for us or uh, anything like that. We love God simply because He is. And we love our neighbor for the sake of God. First of all, because we know that God created him, and because we know that God is working in him no matter how bad he is. And so we love our neighbor for the sake of God. Well, that's like you said you shouldn't lust after your neighbor's Good, but then you want to love your neighbor. Doesn't mean you have to like. Yeah, love does not mean neighbors like. like. My next door neighbor is neighbors like everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what does it consist of? Neighbor, neighbor is everyone. Because if you get like your neighbors, you can move away, right? I suppose you could go to another planet. <laughs> You could go to another planet. Problem solved. Well, I just wonder where the neighbors. It's a lot easier to like people when they're not around, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> I did that before. Well, that goes back to what you said last week. That really stuck with me. How maybe there are people who have lived very, very sinless life or close to sinless, and probably it was in a cave and they didn't yeah. see people. And it is crazy how it's other people. Get yeah. That's, that's so true. Well, and this is, I mean, this is a kind of a, I mean, it's not a silly example. It's a good example. I mean, how do, how do you handle something like that in the daily life? I mean, this is really the task of the spiritual life. My, 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 the point of all of my talks is that our mission in life, our, our divine calling is to become saints. And so in order to become saints, we have to rid ourselves of even the most minor venial sin, of which white lying may be one of them, as long as it's not habitual. And so you have to have a plan in advance. If you know you're going to run into situations like that, you have to have a plan in advance about what you're going to do. Because if you fly by the seat of your pants, uh, you may end up cooperating with the actual grace that God's giving you. You remember actual grace last time. Or you may blow it. Um, so you've got to know. Uh, now, sometimes weird stuff is going to fly at us because we're dealing with other people. Um, but if, it's, if we're routinely encountering the same people, like I routinely encounter people who are in jail and therefore they're really mad about that. And so I, when I go there, I have to have a plan of how am I going to deal with it if this person is, is really uh, not being a very nice person. 
Am I going to, am I going to, to take that? Am I going to, how am I going to respond? So I know, generally speaking, what's going to happen in my day and who I'm going to encounter. And so I have to think about that in advance. And you don't think about that in isolation. I mean, you think about it prayerfully. I mean, that, that, should, that could form the basis for your morning prayer every day. Uh, you make an offering to God and you ask Him for the grace to help you in dealing with people. Because people, um, by virtue of the fact that they're not us, are going to get on our nerves, right? And so we have to deal with that. Yes, but that's not a question about Catholicism. That's a question about my job. Well, you know it's a sin, so I just... It's not a sin to defend somebody. It's not a sin to defend them, but it's a sin for what he did. Yeah, but I don't know if he did or not. I wasn't there. All right, moving on. <laughs> yeah, but he's a murderer. Are you going to trust a murderer? Come on. All right. So there's a unity in the commandments, and we need to, to recognize that there's a unity in these things, okay? Um, they're not in isolation with each other. Uh, by loving God, we honor our neighbor by, uh, uh, I'm gonna, okay, let me just quote this because I'm going to try to wing it, it's going to suck. One cannot honor another person without blessing God. One cannot adore God without loving all men. So we have to keep in mind that there's a relationship here. And, you know, the best way to deal with these sorts of situations, we're talking about in daily life, if you can muster up the recollection, the interior recollection to remember it, is that each person you deal with is like another Christ. I mean, that's how we should view them. This is a person who's created by God. And so I guess the, the thought would be that we need to treat them as if, we were, if, as if they were Christ. I found in my experience that when I go to see the annoying people in the jail, if I try to look at them as a very annoying Christ, I generally treat them better. And so if you did that in your daily life, you know, that may be one way to combat it. You know, if Christ said, how is my hair, you wouldn't want to say, you know, it's not so good today, Christ. You would want to be truthful. And so... I'm not trying to be blasphemous here. I'm trying to prove a point. That is, we should treat everybody like this. I mean, that doesn't mean we need to put them on a pedestal, but it means we need to treat them with the same respect that we would want to be treated. I mean, maybe some days I want to be lied to, but if I was really asked, do I really, really want to be lied to? No. We all want to hear the truth, right? If you do something badly, people should tell you you did it badly. I love the statement, the succinct statement you just read. Would you read it again more Yes, ma'am. One cannot honor another person without... One cannot honor another person without blessing God. One cannot adore God without loving all men. And that's a quote from the Roman Catechism. But I think it's a quote from St. Augustine, perhaps. Do you need... Yeah, I'm using a different book. But if you have the Internet, go to the Internet and type in Roman Catechism. And it's going to be like the first thing that pops up. And if you scroll down on that page, there's a, whole, there's a section there that says the Ten Commandments, Introduction. Click on that, and basically everything I'm talking about tonight is on that page. Um, so let me talk about the commandments and natural law. Because the interesting thing about the commandments, and you will probably notice this by the fact that uh, they're kind of broad, is that the commandments, unlike you know, aspects of the Mosaic Law or aspects of church discipline or church law, are accessible to every person on earth via reason. So these are not things that God had to reveal to us. These are things that we know already because our conscience tells us that certain things are wrong. Every person on earth knows that murdering somebody is wrong. Everybody knows that. Reason tells us that that is true. So since reason tells us these things are true, why did God see fit to give them to us through divine revelation? Well, part of it has to do with the idea of concupiscence. You'll remember from my talk several months ago on original sin, concupiscence is the result of original sin. Basically, our ability to understand reason and our relationship with God is skewed as a result of the fall of Adam and Eve. And so we have a hard time relating to the purity of our consciences, if you will. And so God saw fit to give us a divine revelation to illuminate our natural reason a little bit better. So the Ten Commandments are not a new law, but they are an illumination of existing natural law. And that's another reason why the abrogation of the Mosaic Law with the coming of Christ uh, does not affect the Ten Commandments. 
So, obviously, Christ didn't abrogate natural law. And so, since the Ten Commandments are natural law, they're just a uh, natural law that's been clarified by revelation, they are not abrogated uh, through uh, the fulfillment of the law in Christ. The other thing about the commandments being natural law is that since they are accessible to us through reason, and they're accessible to everyone, they oblige everyone everywhere, and they're always obligatory, and they're always grave matter. So you'll recall when we were talking about mortal sin, every time I've talked to you guys, um, that we talked about the three requirements of mortal sin. The first being, is it grave matter? The second is, did you do it with full consent of the will? And I always miss the third. The third is dealing with your intention and the circumstances around it. And so, if you are sinning against the Ten Commandments, it's always going to be objectively grave matter. So that means that unless you're missing one of the other two aspects of the trinity that forms a mortal sin, if you break a commandment, it's always going to be mortal sin. And the other thing, is, well, and, and that's obviously related to the fact that these, this is, you know, accessible to us through reason. So someone, no one ever has the excuse, well, I didn't know that murder was a mortal sin, and therefore I don't have to confess it. You always know. It's always grave matter. So, going back to the, uh, one sec, going back to the idea of the white lie, for example. Bearing false witness, always grave matter because it relates to the Ten Commandments. But the circumstances may be such uh, that it's not a moral sin that would necessarily need to be confessed. Yes, if one of the three requirements that makes a sin mortal is not present, then it's just a venial sin. Okay. Um, so if something is not grave matter, for example, uh, then it wouldn't be a mortal sin. So if one of those three is present, then... All three have to be present for it to be a mortal sin. If one is lacking, then it would be venial. What was third? Remind me of the third. What's the better way to say the third, Buck? Um, it's, yeah, it's I'll go ahead. Objectively serious. You know it's objectively All right. serious. Full consent of the will. Right. Anyway. right. So the third, in, in the way I said it, would be it's objectively grave sin. Uh, and the second is, you know that it's objectively grave sin, which with the Ten Commandments, those are necessarily there, right? Because we have reason. So we always know that it's grave, and, we, you know, and it is grave. And then the third is that you do it with full consent of the will. So if someone forces you to murder somebody else, you haven't done that with full consent of the will, have you? Um, and so that wouldn't be present. So that would actually be the sin of murder, but it would be ven a venial murder, right? Well, do you have to confess venial? No, you do not have to confess venial sins. Is anger a venial sin? It depends on the circumstances, as I said. If you're angry in a grave way, then it would be a mortal sin as long as the, the three requirements are met. Well, let me clarify that, because the question you're asking is essentially... Do the Ten Commandments encompass everything that's a mortal sin? And the answer is no. There are things that are mortal sins that aren't related to the commandments. Some things that are mortal sins are related to the precepts of the church. I didn't bring my handy book to tell you the precepts of the church, but essentially we know that uh, the church tells us that failing to go to Mass on Sunday would be a mortal sin. Now that's related in some ways to keeping the Sabbath holy, but I can imagine that you could think of other ways to keep the Sabbath holy. Uh, you could probably pray the rosary for all waking hours straight, and that would have been a very holy Sabbath for you. Uh, but the church tells us that you are obliged to go to Mass. And so, failure to go to Mass, in this case, would be a mortal sin, even though it's not necessarily a breaking of that commandment. So there are things outside the scope of the commandments that are mortal sin. So the best way to figure that out is to get a good examination of conscience. Uh, there are pamphlets near the confessional in the church, and to take a look at that. Or to explore several, there's several different ones online. If you go to rcia.cc, there's several different confessions. If you're worrying yeah. about it a lot, it's probably sinful. Yeah, and the, the other thing to keep in mind is that if you go to confession and um, you're not sure whether it's mortal or venial, it's best to confess it anyway. And secondly, you should confess venial sins. Just because you don't have to doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. Uh, so as a devotional practice and in an effort to get the grace that comes from the sacrament of confession, you would still want to confess venial sins anyway. 
there's going to be a certain point, if you care anything or pay any attention at all to the spiritual life, that you're not going to commit mortal sin anymore. And so you're, if you want to go to confession, which you should every two weeks, you're only going to be confessing venial sin anyway. Because if you waited until you committed mortal sin, uh, you're going to be waiting a long time. I think, the I think anger in itself is not necessarily sin. But usually what happens, why we have anger, is because it's directed towards someone or something. And if we direct anger at an individual, how we handle that is going to depend whether it's a sin or not. Okay? Uh, we can be angry, and anger can be truth. Okay? Uh, you know, we can be angry about abortion. That's not a sin to be angry about abortion. Right. Yeah, there are, yeah, there are some sin there is right. some anger that's righteous anger. Right, 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 exactly. So we have to you know there's we have to be able to discern Yeah. You know if we take anger out on somebody and we do harm to them or their family maliciously, verbally, uh, then then yes, that would be a mortal sin. And we can take here the best example that we can think of, and that is Christ, okay? Let's look at the example of Christ. Christ got angry in the temple with the people who were abusing the temple. Uh, for their temporal well-being. And so that's an example of righteous anger. I would say particularly in things having to do with the church, it's sometimes good to be angry about those things. I mean, if you go to Mass, for example, and you see someone who is clearly you know, not engaged and is profaning the Mass in a way, it's good to be angry about that. Now, there may be a course of action A that is a good course of action to take based on that anger, and there may be a bad course of action B that you wouldn't want to take. Um, so, it, it, it some ways is going to depend on how our anger manifests itself. And like the example of abortion is a good one. We should be angry at the idea of evil existing in the world. And we should be angry at people who perpetuate evil in the world. But if our anger is a sort of anger that leads to a seeking of revenge against those people, then that is an anger that's not good. Okay? Uh, and again, we know that anger is obviously important because Christ, in talking about the commandment on murder, tell, talks about anger as the basis of it. So we need to take these things very seriously. Uh, so here's a good quote from the Roman Catechism back on topic about um, the idea that the commandments oblige everyone everywhere because they're available to us through right reason. No one who has arrived at the use of reason can be justified unless he is resolved to keep all of God's commandments. Could you say that again? Sure. No one who has arrived at the use of reason can be justified unless he is resolved to keep all of God's commandments. So what does that mean? That means that if we are of the age of reason, basically if you're old enough to go to confession under the church law, if you want to be saved, you have to follow the commandments. That makes sense. Uh, it makes sense that we would have to follow the most important law that God gave to us, right? Okay. You know, sometimes when I'm reading in the 24-hour liturgy or prayer book or whatever, especially the Bible, sacred scripture, I have to read it like five times, just one chapter to understand what it's saying. That's not necessarily a bad thing. <laughs> I think we could probably all do that so we can make sure that we understand it correctly. I'm actually almost at the end of this talk. So, hooray. All right. Um, as I alluded to before, one of the things about the commandments is that they're really not that hard to follow. Uh, the Council of Trent in the 16th century, St. Augustine, as well as St. James, the Apostle, tell us this. Yet even though the commandments are themselves, well, let me, let me back up and say, I mean, if you find it difficult to not murder people, maybe you should examine how far along you are in the spiritual life, you know. Uh, so, the, the commandments themselves are not hard to follow. And yet, we can't follow them without the divine assistance. As I've said to you many times, Anytime we are left to our own devices, we're necessarily going to fail. And anytime we cooperate with grace, we're necessarily going to succeed. So, as I've suggested in your examination of conscience at the end of each night, you should consider the times during the day where you failed and recognize that those are the times that you have turned away from God and turned away from the grace that He gives you. You should also examine the times that you succeeded and recognize that 
the only reason you succeeded is because God was helping you. So you have to have a healthy distrust of yourself. So we can't be too boastful about our, our failure to, to murder other people. Because without the divine assistance, we would all be, I guess, murdering each other all the time. We would be breaking these commandments all the time. So even though they seem very easy, we need to recognize that it's the divine assistance that makes these commandments easy to follow. What if I have only occasionally found a Well, then you are occasionally cooperating, right? I mean, I don't know. Murder, I mean, that's the extreme example, I think, yeah. in this list. But usually, that's, I mean, I don't, I don't. I don't know. You probably know more murderers than I do. Um, but it seems like... I mean, alleged murderers. Alleged murderers. <laughs> <laughs> but it just kind of seems like that's the one, though, where you have lost all your control and you have absolutely been overwhelmed by anger and frustration and hate and rage. And so you're turning away from God. And at one point, it must be... I don't know. I mean, it just... Well, I, I think you have a good point there, Kelly. I mean... Um, when we get to the ones about not coveting someone else's goods or not coveting someone else's wife, I think that's where we're talking about things that are much more difficult. I mean, even looking at the commandment against stealing, if we really examined ourselves to see, uh, you know, in a strict sort of way how much we steal, you know, if we're wasting time at work, are we stealing from our employer? You know, are we taking office supplies here or there, you know? Um, so there are certainly things that we have to be working on. Um, but... On the big scheme of things, I don't know that you could necessarily say that those things are difficult. I mean, we all are going to have our particular problems in, in, in answering for certain of these commandments. Um, but they're not such that you would say that they're overly burdensome. I mean, perhaps, they sh perhaps we should treat them as such so that we advance in the spiritual life. I and mean, by that I mean we should maybe think about them more so that we're more, in, like I said last time, recollected about our activities from each passing minute. But... Um, I don't think there's, well, let me say it this way. The church tells us, thank you James, the church tells us that they are easy to follow. And yet, the church also tells us that we are going, going to regularly need to go to confession. And so this is one of those instances where we recognize that we are failing to do something that's pretty easy. And then God in His goodness has given us a very easy way to get back on track once we've done so. Uh, and perhaps that's one aspect of what the church means by saying that they're easy to follow. Because it's easy to get back on track once we have failed to follow them. Well, I have, let me read this quote because this may, uh, this is a good quote and I, I think it may, maybe it'll address what you're going to say because I, I think it's a good quote. This is again from the Roman Catechism. This is talking about why the commandments are easy to follow. He who demands our love pours into our hearts by the Holy Ghost the fervor of his love. And this good spirit our Heavenly Father gives to those that ask him with reason. Therefore did St. Augustine pray, Give what thou commandest and command what thou pleasest. As then God is ever ready to help us, especially since the death of Christ the Lord, by which the prince of this world was cast out, there is no reason why anyone should be disheartened by the difficulty of the undertaking. To him who loves, nothing is difficult. And so you see there the fathers of Trent telling us that the ease is in our not being easily discouraged by our own failings. And the ease is by, recognize, by, by understanding that basically all we have to do is to recognize how much God loves us in order to kind of spur us along to action here and doing good. I was going to say with the comment earlier too that uh, mortal sin, a lot of times you're going to be confessing you know, a being of sin. Um, so if you take your mind uh, away from this and focus, like you said a while ago, on, on the positive, that if we live in the spirit of Christ, okay, we abide in him, we have a body, a life. Okay. Uh, if we look to his, if we look to his word and his virtues, and we focus on the attitudes and the virtues that are in place, the more we focus on the good and trying to accomplish this and putting on the mind of Christ, uh, the less apt period is going to be close to the marbles. And to the marbles. 
Yeah, I think that's right. I think that, you know, the, the thing about it is you can look at anything in a negative sort of way as kind of, you know, here's the bound. Don't go beyond this bound because this is a prohibited area. Or you could flip it around and look at the positive. So let's take an example. Um, if you encounter somebody who is going to make you angry, who is going to do something that makes you angry, you can look at it and say, I'm not going to get angry at this person because I'm afraid of the divine retribution for getting angry. Or I'm afraid of being judged in this way, or I'm afraid of how this is going to look. Those sorts of negative aspects of the prohibition. Or you could look at it in terms of, this person is about to make me angry. I want to treat them as I would treat Christ and give them the respect that they deserve as a human being, as a creature of God. And so you've then taken this commandment and flipped it around from being a negative prohibition to being a positive sort of uh, spur along to do better. And so you could apply that to, I think, any of the commandments, really. Um, and it's somewhat related in, to, to the last little thing that I want to talk about. Uh, the Roman Catechism tells us that the observance of the commandments is attended by many blessings. And this is a really interesting thing. The observers of the law of God are filled with pure delights, with knowledge of divine mysteries, and are blessed with plenteous joys and rewards both in this life and in the life to come. And I think that we all know this is true. We have sort of an innate sense, sometimes, not always, sometimes it's an emotional feeling, but not most of the time, when we're on the right path. And so, this is related to the idea of theosis that I was talking about last time. Our goal, our ultimate goal, is that we all want to respond to the divine calling to be saints. And the way that we do that is by more and more complying with the grace of God and seeking to identify with Christ so that we're living this life in Christ, which is what these chapters are about. That's the idea of theosis. We want to... Well, the scripture says, uh, God became man so that man could become like God. This is our goal. That's our calling as, as people. And so when we are living a life in accordance with that, chief among them will be following the commandments, having the right belief and having the right works, if you will. Things are going to be delightful in our life. That doesn't mean that you know we're going to be walking on uh, streets of gold and rainbows are going to appear everywhere and we're going to be, I don't know, have all sorts of great sensory things going on. What it means is that you're going to find that it's easier to bear the sufferings of the daily life and the daily mortifications that dealing with other people brings, and you're going to find the delight in these things because you're going to recognize when these sorts of uh, crosses come, that it's when the crosses come that God is treating you like his own son. Uh, we know that we're closely identified with Christ when God the Father treats us like he treated Christ. That is, he allowed him to suffer crosses, and he gave him the assistance that he needed to do that. And so we can tell when we're on the right path. Part of that path involves following these commandments. The other interesting thing is, and that's kind of talking about this temporal life that we're leading now, but the Roman Catechism tells us that God has deigned to identify his own glory with what conduces to our advantage. So by following the commandments, we give glory to God. And yet, by following the commandments, we also avail ourselves of the eternal reward of heaven. And how much does God love his people that he set us up a system where we're rewarded for doing exactly what we're supposed to be doing anyway? It could have just as easily been set up to be, well, you do this and, you know, great, you did it because we should be doing these things for the sake of doing them because we love God. But he recognized in his goodness that we might need, at some points in the spiritual life, a little bit more of a reward than that. And so we have the reward of heaven. I guess the flip side of that is that for those times where we're re really struggling with the spiritual life, sometimes we need uh, the possibility of damnation, too. And uh, there are, I don't know, Dennis probably knows this better than I saw Dennis walk in. He knows more about this than I do. The uh, uh, different levels of the love of God. I think it was St. Bernard. St. Bernard and the different levels of the love of God. The first is basically the fear of going to hell. And the second is... You love God 
Right, loving God because you love yourself. And the third is loving God for the sake of him being God. So those are the different levels of love according to St. Bernard. And so sometimes we need level one. I don't know if St. Did St. Bernard mean that we're supposed to progress up these? Because it seems like sometimes in life we find ourselves at level one and we might jump right to level three but then kind of go back to level two. So I guess we should be striving to love God simply for his sake. But sometimes we need to love God because we're afraid of going to hell. Sometimes we need to love God because uh, we want the reward. That's loving God for ourselves. And then sometimes we'll actually rise to a level of purity where we're loving God simply because He is God and He created us. There's a greater level of fullness within ourselves. You know, God tries to draw us into greater and greater fullness. And that fullness is in Christ who He is, that we are to become well, we are to become true. So it's not only reaching that eternal reward, but it's becoming more complete and more whole as to what we bring to to be. And all these other three things that you know, Dennis mentioned well, is all drawn into the fact that we are coming to greater fullness in Christ. We're putting on the mind of Christ and living yeah, and it really makes a lot of sense if you think about it, because if our ultimate goal is to, is to be in heaven and to be in the presence of God, where we will have an understanding of God that allows us to love Him simply because He is, then it makes sense that we would want to start preparing ourselves for that sort of environment here on earth. And it also makes sense that we would necessarily not be allowed to enter into such a close relationship with God unless we were prepared for it, hence purgatory. So this is where we can see the convergence of the moral theology and the doctrinal theology as we've been talking about in the class. Matt. And what we're awfully talking about is salvation. Right. And it shows why salvation is a process and not an event. Right. That this process ebbs and flows because of our weakness and because of free will, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately, we have to keep striving for that perfection. Right. And for that love. And uh, that's what the... That's what, what, that's what the difference is. That's where you can see, obviously, how can it be an event? Right. <laughs> yeah, we, I, think we, I think we can recognize from our personal experience that there's no event in our life that makes it where we find it very easy in the sense of our ease, the colloquial sense of the word ease, to simply follow all the commandments and to never sin. That never happens for us. We are instead on a continual journey to correspond to grace at every moment of our lives and to kind of battle against our own, uh, ourselves in the daily life, and to uh, work against that. Now, let me turn to what the chapter was actually about, and that is this idea of social justice. Well, it plays into it. <laughs> if you don't know that, you're going to hell. <laughs> I think that <laughs> All right. Yeah. I missed that. <laughs> <laughs> to play it back. <laughs> All right. Um, I was just making fun of the people who are going to watch this, that if they don't know the church's teaching on social justice, they're going to go to hell. So while we were on commercial break, we learned from Buck that the church's teaching on social justice is probably better called the church's teaching on social doctrine. So the church has a certain doctrine on how we all relate to each other. And it was also pointed out very astutely that uh, the church's teaching and God's teaching in, on the Ten Commandments is obviously related to this. So, once we move the Ten Commandments out, we can see the bigger picture, and that is that we're all related to each other in some way. And we all have to treat each other in a certain way, because, as Christ tells us, we want to love each other for the sake of God. And so, we have to treat each other individually with the respect that comes from that. That necessarily implies that we have to treat each other, treat groups of people with the same respect. And so the church has basically two different doctrines regarding social teaching that are important. And uh, Sister Elizabeth usually gives this talk, but I'll give it real quick. The church teaches, first of all, the idea of solidarity. That is that we are all related to each other in some way and we all have to look out for each other. The second thing is subsidiarity, and that is that basically problems should be handled at the lowest possible level because that's the way for uh, people who actually can assess the problem to deal with it. 
So that's essentially the, doc the, <laughs> the social doctrine of the church. We can see it plays out in a number of different ways, and we're actually living in an era where the social doctrine of the church is coming into play with regard to this whole idea of universal health care. Um, now, there are some who are smarter than I am, but that doesn't stop me from participating in the discussion, uh, about the, whether universal health care or these sorts of things are actually in accordance with Catholic teaching. So the church from time to time, being a universally applicable church, is over governments. The church takes precedence over governments. So the church has a right not to order governments around, but to suggest to governments that certain things they're doing are moral or immoral. So from time to time, uh, various popes have issued encyclicals, for example, to deal with these sorts of social aspects of things. Um, there's a really famous encyclical by Pope, I want to say, Leo XIII on socialism that I would recommend everyone reading because what he goes into in the idea of socialism is basically that you cannot be both Catholic and socialist. And there are implications for that in terms of the church's teaching on solidarity and subsidiarity. Obviously, socialism is against the church's teaching on subsidiarity. And so, you could make a compelling argument that universal health care, for example, would be uh, not because it's necessarily socialistic in nature, but because it uh, fails to take into account the church's teaching on subsidiarity, that it's, it's not uh, kosher, if you will, with Catholic doctrine. This is also relevant, I think, for the current discussion on this uh, proposed HHS ruling that deals with artificial birth control and health care. Um, it's probably against the church's teaching for a government to tell employers what sort of health care they have to provide for their employees because the church is not, because the government is not allowed to really meddle at that sort of level according to the church's teaching. Uh, so I'm not going to go into all the social teaching of the church because I frankly don't know enough about it to really give you every answer to every question. But it's important to know that the church promulgates teachings on these things, and secondarily, that the church is not doing so in vain. The church has the authority to do these things. And so it's important to recognize that the church has social, social teaching. Um, some of these are related to the moral theology that we've been talking about Obviously, you all know that the church is anti-abortion, anti-birth control, these sorts of things. Uh, and those are related to the Ten Commandments in various ways. Uh, but maybe I'll leave it there on social teaching, and if you have any questions based on what was in the chapter that I haven't covered, you could ask me, or if you have any other questions, uh, I think we have maybe an extra five minutes before you've got to start the discussion of the right of election. So, any questions? I think the main thing to understand is that social justice is an outpouring of grace, and that it's through the grace we receive from God first that we are compelled to go forth and to feed the hungry and clothe the poor. Yeah. And not that we go out and run around and be a, and that social justice is the church. I think that's the distinct difference there, because that's yes. kind of a tendency where a lot of people that have ran to. That's a very good point, and let me address that, because this is an important aspect of the church's teaching, okay? The church teaches through the ordinary magisterium that class structures within society are divinely ordained. God saw fit to create poor people, rich people, middle class people, and everybody in between. And so, in a sense, when you use the word social justice, it implies that at some point we're going to reach a point in society where everybody is equal and everybody's got everything they need and everybody's fine. That's not possible. And so calling the church's teaching in this area social justice is really a misnomer because we're never going to attain justice. We're only going to attain justice in heaven, right? Assuming that justice is everybody getting whatever they want. Um, so it's just not going to happen. And so there really is no th such thing as social justice because the church teaches that there are different classes of people. This is how things are. And so, yes, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't work to, uh, you know, visit the imprisoned, clothe the naked, feed the hungry, and these sorts of things. But we do those on an individual and maybe parish and local level. We don't do those things on a national level because we're not trying to equalize everybody like a socialistic or, or some political system like that would be trying to do. That's not our goal. 
Our goal is to alleviate temporal suffering so that people can better be prepared for eternal life. We're mainly concerned with the salvation of souls. To the extent that that impinges on people's physical well-being so that their souls can be saved, that's the church's teaching on social, just, social doctrine. Yeah, I would probably ask that, that if, if you try to do it another way, if you have this model whereby you believe that you can achieve, achieve perfect justice and perfect equality over the entire earth, that does two things. First of all, it kind of removes God from the equation and gives us the idea that we can do it all ourselves. Uh, and um, I'm having a Rick Perry moment here because of my migraine. I can't remember the other thing I read. It's um, utopian. It is utopian, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what it should happen. Well, because we, um, we don't need heaven if we can create it here on earth. So we don't need God and we don't need heaven if we ourselves, without God, can create a heaven here on earth. Yeah. And that's not going to happen before you always have with you. Uh, yeah. that, uh, that if you look at the Bible, if you look at the catechism, we're generally going to go downhill until we, we crash and then God creates the world anew again. Right. That's God doing that, not us. Right. But we do have to work on an individual level, as Mark says, uh, to, you know, to act locally, think locally, act locally. Right. And I, I, I think people need to be aware and probably are. And I don't know how this happened because I don't think social justice was originally a secular term. I think it was originally a theological term. I'm not sure. But anyway, the term social justice has been co-opted by political ideologues and, and leftist ideologues. Uh, to mean something very different, it means the egalitarianism that Buck was just talking about. Right. If you go out here, on a, especially on a college campus or somewhere there are a lot of pseudo-intellectuals and politically activist left-wing folks, you will find that everybody spouting social justice is also pro-abortion, you know, pro-ordination of homosexuals, pro-ordination of women, pro-gay marriage, right down the line. So the term is politically loaded and it's really unfortunate um, that we use it so much. Yeah, I agree. Doug? Wasn't there, uh, like you were talking about taking matters a minute ago, about like, uh, yeah, you could try the Baltimore Catechism, might be what you're thinking of. There's a more question and answer sort of thing dealing with the Ten Commandments. But we're going to go into each of them at, through the next few weeks, so you get more than you can handle of each commandment. Kelly? Um, okay. You just say what you said. I'll do my question, but you know, pro gay, pro abortion. Which, by the way, I've never met anybody pro abortion that I know. Of. But um, anyway, um, okay. Let's say you know somebody. How do you take the social justice justice concept and and this not sin concept and treat people that you know are bad with respect? You know, like like if you know someone is a habitual. I don't know, y'all, I seem like this class wants to say gay is the ultimate evil. I think, like, alcoholics. Okay, there's a good example. Alcoholics. Like, on one hand, you hear that's a disease. But on the other hand, these people can really hurt others and do horrible things to other people. How do you treat them like Christ when they are so not like Christ? Well, I think that's a great mystery. Um, I mean, how do you, I mean, like, in a very literal sense, do you say, like, how are you today? And that's, I mean, that's hard sometimes. Even, you know, when you... Well, I have to say something. God said, when Jesus Christ came, He said, I, come, I didn't come for the righteous, I come for the sinners. He came for the sinners. Especially those people that are in the garden who should see Christ in them. Most of them. So you just try to pour that love. See, you have to love them because God knows them no, first no. before we can love them. No, we, we learned last week we do judge. You do judge. But you judge God, their actions to be evil. Yeah. Right, we don't judge the individual, we judge their actions. Right. Yeah. To respect their dignity as a exactly. 